This video was brought to you by Curiosity Stream. Sign up today with the link in the description and also get access to my streaming service Nebula for free. Can you explain the logic for the super fast Q&A song, please? Sure, it was all about superimposing triplets against quintuplets. The vocal rhythm is all in triplets. Super fast Instagram Q&A. The groove and the bass line are all in this quintuplet swing. I really like when triplets superimpose against quintuplets, which create this five against three kind of feel. There's something about that that feels really nice, That I don't really get from other kind of polyrhythmic combinations. But that was the main idea with the theme song. Theme song? Introduction? Is this like a sitcom? Why are horn sections often a little bit too late? Yeah, horn players often play really behind the beat, don't they? Almost to the point where it's too late. I'm gonna ask my friend Brian Plouts, who leads the band Aberdeen, why horn players are just so rhythmically deficient. Hey. Hello. Why do horn players suck? Short answer, I don't know. Long answer, probably many reasons. Great. <laughs> so I think a lot of horn players focus heavily on improvisation more so than rhythm section players. Like that's their primary focus, or at least people in my community. I was looking at artists like Dexter Gordon who like has this really laid back feel. So then when I started doing horn section work, I had to kind of unlearn some of the things that I was learning for my rhythmic feel while improvising. And then also something I thought of was maybe a lot of horn players started by um, just like doing their school band programs. Mm. And in band programs, you're following the director and you're like following visual cues. So I wonder if maybe that's a factor where horn players more often than maybe drummers or bassists, maybe this is very general, may have started band programs where they're like relying on following more than dictating where the groove is and maybe anticipating. So that might be a factor. Does beatboxing as a solo art have a space in the New York music scene? I don't know a whole lot specifically about it, but of course the beatboxer that I know and have worked with before is a guy by the name of Gene Shinozaki. He has a group of beatboxers that call themselves the Beatbox House. And the reason why I know him is because he's worked a lot with apartment sessions. The idea of course behind apartment sessions is to cram a bunch of musicians into a tiny cramped space, a small Brooklyn apartment, and that concept has not aged very well in the past six months, but back when it was happening, it was a lot of fun. The idea was that it would kind of be a melting pot for different musicians and styles in this kind of chamber orchestra setting. And whenever Gene joined that setting, it was very interesting hearing how he incorporated vocal percussion into a more orchestral and classical setting. <laughs> I don't think too many composers have really done that before and really explored what vocal percussion in the tradition of beatboxing can really add to an ensemble. But beyond that, yes, I think that beatboxing has a very strong presence here in New York City. I've seen Beatbox House perform at Rockwood Music Hall, and it's an amazing experience. A beatbox crew sounds like a full band. It sounds like a DJ set. It's incredible. How do I make my guitar solos sound less like guitar solos? Okay, you're going to make me play guitar now, I see. Uh, great. <clears throat> uh, why does anybody play this stupid instrument? <laughs> Just look at it. Just, mm. How can anybody hear that and think, this is what I want to do with my life? You know what, forget it. Uh, just, we're not, we're not gonna do it. We're gonna answer this question with me on bass, as God intended. So obviously, don't play guitar, but if you have to play guitar, it's a great book called The Advancing Guitarist by Mick Goodrick. And there's an exercise in the beginning that he calls the science of the unitar. Essentially what that is, is playing a solo just on one string. And when you do that, you don't have any of the licks and any of the muscle memory that you've developed as a guitar player over your entire guitar playing career. Again, don't know why you'd have it, but... Please. So you're focused more on the vertical side of the instrument rather than the horizontal side of the instrument. Vertical, horizontal, you get the picture. So if I were to play like an E minor nine on the G string, 
I'd have to think very carefully about where my hand is moving up and down the neck. You can kind of do this fun call and response thing by playing notes up high on the neck and then jumping down on the string. And that sliding up and down feels very unguitaristic. That's a word. It feels more uh, sitaristic. Something to that effect. Favorite contemporary composer of the 21st century? Lewis Cole. Did you ever expect your channel to be this big? <laughs> God no, and it is terrifying. How would you resolve an A6 sharp 5 sharp 9 11 chord? Uh, okay, that is a hell of a chord. Let's try it. Let's talk about this chord, shall we? So the sharp five, the sharp nine, and the 11 of this A6 chord form what looks like a G sus triad. What's God's favorite chord? G sus, ha <laughs> ha. On the bottom, there's a normal A6 chord, which is very consonant, but there's a lot of intervallic clashing occurring on top with this G sus. One thing you can do whenever you have a really dissonant structure is resolve all of the voices within that dissonant structure by a half step. So if we have a G, a C, and a D in this chord, the D could resolve up to D sharp, the C could resolve down to B, and the G could resolve down to F sharp, giving us kind of an A69 sharp 11. Kind of creepy. I like it though. What's your favorite interval? I like perfect fifths, because you can stack them really high and they sound really pretty when they're stacked on top of one another. And also, minor ninths. Live in LA and want to pursue musical career. Stay LA where have a network or study in New York. That's actually a really great question because that's something that I think about all the time living in New York City. Do I stay here in New York and have this musical scene around me or do I move to LA? Whenever I've visited LA for functions like NAM, where the entire industry gets together in one location, the thing that's very apparent to me is that LA is where the music industry is. That's where the money is, that's where the jobs are. There are many, many more people who work in the music industry than just the musicians themselves. And so that's where the pop industry is, that's where the film scoring industry is. There's so much industry there. New York has a fantastic musical scene, but there is just really no money to be made specifically in New York unless you're doing weddings. Most of the money is just musicians giving each other $50 bills after gigs. Studying in New York City, though, I think is a wonderful experience for young musicians being exposed to jazz, or at least that's how it used to be in the before times, but I think things will definitely start to kick up again this spring. The before times, I, like people are saying that so unironically now, it's actually getting kind of scary. Anyway, New York is a great place if you want to be a musician, but LA is where the industry is. Pollo a la brasa. <laughs> so yeah, Peruvian chicken. Give me some pollo a la brasa with some Inca cola, and I, I'm set, man. I love this stuff. If you don't know what Inca cola is, by the way, don't worry. I am also gringo, but it smells kind of like cotton candy, but tastes like pure sugar. It's amazing. It goes very well with Peruvian chicken. This has nothing to do with music, by the way but it's something that you should really know about me. Thoughts on Christian Lee? Yeah, Christian Lee is an amazing keyboard player. He's the touring keyboard player for Sungazer. He also plays with Childish Japes occasionally. Just a great musician. I always learn a lot whenever I get the chance to play with Christian Lee. He always has a unique approach to evoking a particular feeling and a particular emotion, like a visceral bodily emotion with his harmony and with his piano playing, and I've never really heard or seen anything like it. When we were touring, he always used to play this outro to our tune, Drunk. And there was something about how he played the outro which made it feel almost microtonal, even though he was just playing on a regular 12-tone equal-tempered keyboard. The way he was able to improvise voice leading the same way that we voice led that G sus chord earlier had a very particular feeling to it and he was very good at tapping into that feeling. And I think that is an important thing for any improviser is to tap in to the feeling of whatever notes you're playing. It seems like it's an obvious thing, but honestly, when we get so bogged down into all of the harmonic language that we learn and we use as jazz musicians, we sometimes forget what music feels like. What are double sharps slash double flats used for? So there's a rule that music teachers very rarely teach you when you're first learning the basics of Western music notation, and it's actually very important. 
I'm not sure if it even has a technical name, but I'm going to call it the alphabetical rule because it involves notes in alphabetical order. For every seven note scale, you must name each note in alphabetical order. So any scale starting on an A, whether it's A flat or A sharp or whatever, will read A, B, C, D, E, F, G, no matter what. This will never change. Some form of B will always follow from some form of A. So say we take the hypothetical key of A sharp major. We start on an A sharp, and the next note in the scale would be a C, right? Except we can't call it a C because of the alphabetical rule. It has to be some form of B. So we have to call this note, which looks like a C, a B sharp. My so what comes after B sharp? Well, it looks like a D on the piano, but because of the alphabetical rule, it has to be some form of C. So it's not going to be C sharp, it's going to be C double sharp. Yes, the double sharp sign looks very strange. It looks like a weird X or a weird cross. I could not tell you why it looks that way. Maybe just because two sharps in a row might look a little too messy. I think it looks pretty cool, but there we go. Now this alphabetical rule has some pretty profound ramifications once you start getting into certain note names and chord symbols and other things. Diminished seventh chords, for example, can be a complete mess when you're trying to name things the correct way. Also, octatonic scales, scales which have eight notes or more, don't follow this alphabetical rule. They can't because there are only seven note names and these scales have eight notes, so how could you only have one version of each note name? Anyway, the more you work with Western notation, the more you realize that it's just kind of all thrown together in this melting pot, this hodgepodge of all these ideas that have just kind of accumulated over the thousand years of development. The one thing, though, that remains relatively stable throughout all of that is this alphabetical rule. The note names must be in alphabetical order, and because of that, you get these fairly strange situations where you have things like double sharps. Add dumb. Sorry, parentheses. We've reached peak humor here, guys. Peak humor. What's up, dog? <laughs> Never mind. Never mind, that was not peak humor. This is peak humor. Behold. Why does a chord like F major seven over G resolve so nicely to C? Heart smiley face emoji thing. Well, that F major seven over G is kind of like a replacement for a G sus triad. And because of that, it has the tendency to have a dominant function. And dominant function chords want to resolve in the Western canon to tonic function chords, in that case, a C. So this F major 7 over G resolves nicely to C because it follows the 5-1 cadential patterns of the Western canon, otherwise known as the harmonic styles of 18th century European musicians. Call back to last week's video. We'll talk more about that later. Why do you think some people see video game music as not real music? Well, I think it's very much tied to how traditionally film music was not even considered real music, but even recently a certain crowd has been incredibly reluctant to accept film music as true music. There was recently a review of John Williams conducting his own film scores with the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra that gave the recording a zero-star review. So even the broader acceptance of film music in certain circles is a long way off, never mind video game music. I think it takes generations literally dying off before certain art forms are actually accepted in the general popular sphere as being quote unquote legitimate. It sucks, but I think one of the things that is really awesome about spaces like YouTube is that you have a group of young musicians who are doing a lot to really canonize and categorize and celebrate video game music in a way where future generations will be able to look at video game music as a canon and as something worth preserving. You got people like Charlie Rosen and the 8-Bit Big Band. You also have, of course, Carlos from Insane in the Rain Music and many other musicians who are doing their best to elevate video game music to a real body of work. It's gonna be a while, but things are already starting to change from this niche little musical genre and this musical world to a broader accepted musical art form. How to do music when your hand is damaged and haven't been able to play for two years. Well, I'm very sorry to hear that. I hope that you have been enriching your life with music in as many ways as you can. There is a long history of people who are not able-bodied who have been able to do great things in music. Of course, there's Django Reinhardt, 
who only famously had two fingers in his left hand. There's a bass player by the name of Bill Clements, who famously only has use of his left hand, and so he's able to play bass simply by tapping with his left hand, and it's pretty incredible to watch him play, because he's developed a style that you simply can't really do with both hands. It's unique to him. It's awesome. There's a famous concerto that the composer Maurice Ravel composed called Concerto for the Left Hand that was composed by an Austrian pianist by the name of Paul Wittgenstein, who lost his right hand in World War I. So there are definitely creative ways of working within a physical limitation, but one of the best things to happen to modern musicianship is the invention of a digital audio workstation. Digital audio workstations are probably the best thing to happen to music accessibility probably ever because there's such an infrastructure right now for accessibility and interfacing with computers that it really doesn't matter what your accessibility needs are, they're probably going to be met. So bust open GarageBand, bust open Ableton Live, start inputting notes, start making beats. I know it might not be what you got into music for originally, but there's such a wide palette to work with. It does make it easy to do music, no matter who you are and where you're coming from. Is Hera better than the Viper? Well, I do really enjoy Hera's playing, and I think that AM winning the Battle for Africa was very good for the whole scene. I have to say that I am a big fan of the snake. Who is the most creative person on the interwebs? Probably Ben Levin. I think his stuff constantly pushes the envelope of what it means to be a YouTuber and what it means to create social media art, whatever that is. How do you deal with jealousy as an artist slash performer? So back when I was first learning how to play bass, I learned how to read tabs from a website called mxtabs.com, .net, something like that. The forums there really hated Mark Hoppus of Blink-182. They thought he was a complete hack. He didn't deserve to have the fame and success that he did. I'm not really quite sure why there was such a hatred for Mark Hoppus then. It's not really in vogue to hate Mark Hoppus now, but trust me, back then, Mark Hoppus was the worst human being on the planet if you're at mxtabs.com. I think later it was Pete Wentz of Fallout Boy. Anyway, I never really understood that hatred, to be honest. I mean, I didn't think he was a great bass player, but honestly, I felt that kind of toxic hatred and toxic jealousy of somebody, even back then when I was first starting out, kind of defeated the point, it didn't really make music fun. This jealousy, I feel like, is always coming from a place of, well, why do they have the success that I don't have yet? And I think it's important to consider that there's always a reason, just or otherwise, why somebody is where they are in their career. They might have gotten lucky in one way or another. You might not be recognizing what their talents are, whether or not it's songwriting or performing or just in general being a good hang. And the more you let go of your jealousy of others and other success, the more room you have in your own life and your own career to focus really just on making yourself the best musician and best human you can be. So Mark Hoppus, wherever you are, I'm so sorry for whatever dumb forum post I made when I was 15 years old railing against you and your band. I, I think Blink-182 is awesome. Sorry. <laughs> Are platforms like Nebula slash CuriosityStream the ultimate solution for YouTube dominance? I do think for some people, like myself, uh, the streaming service Nebula actually does represent a pretty good alternative to YouTube as a place to avoid demonetization and also any kind of algorithmic nonsense. CuriosityStream is today's sponsor, alongside Nebula, which is the creator-owned streaming service that features many of YouTube's top educational creators, like for example, Thomas Frank, Polyphonic, Legal Eagle, Braincraft, and many, many more. It's a great place to watch and discover quality content ad-free and also support your favorite creators. You also get to watch an extended version of this video without the ad, where I address some of the controversy from my most recent video on music theory and white supremacy. And there is, of course, quite a bit of controversy around that one. This video and Nebula is supported by CuriosityStream, the best place on the internet to watch documentaries with thousands of titles to choose from. If you sign up to CuriosityStream with the link in the description or curiositystream.com slash Adam Neely, you'll also get a subscription to Nebula for free. What's more is that for a limited time, a year of both CuriosityStream and Nebula will just cost you $14.79, a 26% discount. By signing up to CuriosityStream with the link in the description, you're not only going to be helping out this channel, but the entire educational community here on YouTube as we help build a platform form in Nebula for thoughtful content that engages the world in a meaningful way. Thanks for watching everybody, and remember, Jesus loves you.
not a funny joke.